Hey everybody, it's Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I want to welcome you this uh, this morning to our midweek video. It'll be released on Thursday morning. Today is Wednesday, February 9. And we want to welcome you here to our YouTube channel. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell so that you can stay current with the ministry here as we create content midweek, as well as when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings. Glad that you've joined us today for this video. Our featured book for the month of February is my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. Uh, this book is about, as the title suggests, uh, tracing Bollinger's ministry with a particular interest and focus on understanding exactly when and where and why Bollinger uh, swung from what would be considered a mid-Acts or an Acts 13 view of when the body of Christ began to the Acts 28 position. So if you're interested in the history of dispensationalism or this important figure in the history of dispensationalism, please consider picking up a copy of my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger. We appreciate your support for the ministry. also want to remind you here about our Rumble channel. In 2021, we moved to establish this Rumble channel as an alt tech site to YouTube should something happen to our YouTube ministry. And we are up to 179 subscribers here on Rumble. So we appreciate those of you that have joined us here. Please, please get help spread the word about this as uh, things continue to go uh, ever so sideways, I suppose, with issues related to uh, censorship and those those kinds of things. So be uh be proactive and uh, join us here on Rumble if you are so inclined. So the last two midweek videos, I've been talking sort of about this topic of pilfering the paper pope. And this is a spinoff of a message that I did in uh, 2017 for our Bible conference at Grace Life Bible Church, where we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And I did a study uh, that is, as part of that conference called Pilfering the Paper Pope of Protestantism, Why the Reformation Fizzled. And so we've been working sort of off those notes as a base to create a few smaller studies here um, to hopefully, you know, get the word out on a few uh, points that were covered in a little bit less formal way and also be able to show on the screen, you know, some of the resources and some of the uh, places where uh, I got that information from. So in the first sort of mini video in this mini series, we were talking about the assessing the origins of the originals only position. And I took you through two examples of uh, reformed dogmaticians, reformed theologians, uh, one Lutheran, one uh, reformed, I guess, in the sense of uh, Calvinistic reformed. And we also looked at the Westminster Confession of Faith, talking about bibliology or the view of the Bible. And we saw how the Protestant reformers definitely viewed the copies, the apographia, as in, inspired, as infallible, as carrying the truth of the original. We saw that in what they said, uh, in what the Lutheran dogmaticians said, and we also saw it in Francis Turretin. And then I talked to you about how that was attacked as part of the Catholic Counter-Reformation by the Catholic priest slash monk Richard Simon, and how he tried to attack the Protestant principle of Sola Scriptura by arguing that the first originals were lost, the copies were full of errors and mistakes, and so therefore you needed the Catholic Church and their tradition to interpret Scripture. And so we were looking at where the idea that only the originals only were inspired and infallible came from, and we saw that that idea was deposited into the thought stream by Richard Simon in the late 1600s, middle to late 1600s. Then in the second video last week in this series, I wanted to show you how Westcott and Hort's attitude toward the text was uh, so-called neutral or naturalistic. And they, they approached the biblical text with the presupposition that the Bible is like any other book of antiquity, and it should be treated based upon the same rules of textual criticism that you would approach any other book. That there was nothing unique or distinct about the scripture. I showed you quotes from Hort's Life and Letters, where he called the text of the Reformation the... Um, the Texas Receptus, he called it vile and villainous. He said that it was marred by Byzantine corruptions and how they needed to establish a new Greek text that was not that way and how he and Westcott were endeavoring to do that. And then I showed you in correspondence uh, with uh, Lightfoot how Hort 
suggest that the Bible could have had uh, corruptions in it from the hand of the original uh, authors or the amanuensis. And so we looked at what they had to say about the biblical text, and we saw that their, their, their presuppositions, their starting point was such that they did not view the biblical text as uh, infallible, even coming from the hands of the original authors themselves. And we saw that if he, he tells Lightfoot that if Lightfoot was going to make belief in the infallibility of the New Testament a prerequisite to them working together on a project, then Hort was going to have to not be involved in that project. And I showed you that in this study here, which is the second study of the three. And now we're going to get to the way I want to wrap this up. Okay. So what I want to cover in this video is reaction and response to the publication of the revised version in 1881 and what the world of the day, not what people today in the 20th and 21st century have said about it, but what was said about the revised version when it was first published back in the late 19th century. And I've got four examples here that I want to go through. And just so you're kind of aware of the format I'm going to follow here, I have all of these typed up nice and neatly here in this set of notes from the, the church, the study I did at church back in 2017. But then I also have all four examples here called up in PDFs of each example. So I'm probably going to be moving back and forth between them just because it's a little bit easier to read them here and neatly typed uh, and find the information that I want to read. But I do want you to see where I'm getting the information from. All right. So this first one that we want to talk, the, the, the revised version was released in the spring of 1881, and there was immediate reaction to it as soon as it was released. So on the May 26, 1881, there's an issue of the Free Religious Index that runs a piece titled The New New Testament. The New New Testament. And that's this piece right here, okay? The Free Religious Index, Light, Liberty, Right, Truth for Authority, Truth for Authority, Not Authority for Truth. And this is a weekly paper devoted to free religion. And you can see this is uh, from Boston, Massachusetts from 18. This particular issue is from 1880 to 1881. And we're going to be looking at things here in volume one. OK, so we want to now go to the page that this article starts on. And you can see here is the story, the new New Testament. And we want to be looking at this column over here. I don't have time to read all this to you. I'll try to put a link to this in the description for the video where you can uh, read the entirety of it for yourself. So we want to start here with the paragraph that says, and we. So I believe that's this paragraph right here. Notice what it says. And we think one of the certain efforts of this acceptance of the revised version will be the increase of more rational views about the Bible. A book that can be amended cannot be infallible. So they're talking about the changes that have happened to the New New Testament of the Revised Version, and if it can be amended, then it can't be infallible. Yet thousands of readers of the King James Version have read it in the firm belief that, that they were reading an infallible book. Now let's stop right there. That is telling you that in the United States, this paper is from Boston, Massachusetts, that thousands of readers in the 19th century were reading the King James Bible as though it were infallible. They will now begin to see that that belief, at least, was a mistake. So they're going to see that it's a mistake to read the King James Bible with the understanding that's infallible because of the New New Testament. But since no claim is made that the new revising committee has been inspired and their process of working with the uh, instruments of human scholarship is even frankly described, uh, have these readers an infallible book now? Have any mistakes been corrected? Are these manuscripts that are talked about on what authority do they rest? And so the question, now watch, and so the question of infallibility having been once started among the readers who never raised it before, it may not rest until it reached the question of original authorship and the popular theories of the Bible be reconstructed on a more rational basis. From this point of view, Sorry, from this point of view, therefore, the revised New Testament has a special interest for liberals. That the revision on points where any doctrinal changes involve favors favors liberal Christian 
favor, sorry, favors liberal Christian rather than the orthodox interpretation is also apparent. This is not me saying this. This is them saying this in the newspaper here, in this paper, that this is favoring the liberal Christian. But this is a mat. But but this is a matter of much less uh, moment than setting the Bible readers' wits to work on the question whether the Bible is re whether the Bible he is reading is an infallible book. Let the question once fairly get started among the plain thinking people of Christendom in the 19th century, and the 20th century will answer it by placing the Bible on the library shelves alongside of other historical religious books classified as one of the human literatures of world's religions. Is this not exactly what happened? Is this not largely what happened to the scripture? once all of this began to be questioned. And so we see here from an article from May 6, 1881, that it did not take but a split second, pretty much, for people to begin to question this. Now, if you were on the liberal end of the theological spectrum, you were praising the revised version. If you were on the conservative end of the theological spectrum, even back when it was released, you were bemoaning the release of the revised version. And here he, here he is saying it. Once the question of infallibility was raised in a way that it never had been raised before, it's going to lead to a questioning of the Bible, a devaluing of the Bible, to use Theodore Leitus's term, a desacralization of the Bible that is going to relegate it to the shelf the same as all of the other books behind me. In other words, there's nothing special. There's nothing unique. There's nothing supernatural about the Bible. It is, in fact, like any other book, which is the presupposition that Westcott and Hort started their revision with. Now, we want to look at another example here. And this time, we want to look at the Dublin Review. So we're going to look at the Dublin Review from July, October 1881. So this is very soon, again, after the release of the revised version. So here we have the Dublin Review. This is the third series, volume six. And we can see that it is from July through October of 1881. Now, in this particular case, I am going to read from, I think, my notes because it's going to be easier for me to find things. But I do want you to see where this article starts. And uh, we'll go to that page. And here we can see the beginning of the article in question, the revision of the New Testament. So again, this article is talking about the revision of of the revised New Testament that came out in 1881. And we can see that from the dates here that I just showed you. So this time I do want to go back to the notes and I want to read from the notes. Okay. And then I also have all the page numbers marked, but this is where I am getting it from, from this story right here in the Dublin review. It's just going to be easier for me to find the content in my type notes. Okay. So there's a lot, this article from the Dublin review is pregnant with information that is extremely relevant to this conversation, okay? And let's just read through a few of these things and see. Now, I'm hoping you're not going to find this boring. you got to understand wh what was being said at the time that the, new, that the revised version was released. They start, and I believe this is from page 133 and 134. They say, now it must be remembered that since the year 1611, a new science has been born into the world called textual criticism, a science which professes to be to enable men of sufficient self-confidence to determine with absolute certainty by the aid of a small number of manuscripts hardly legible what the text of, text of the scripture really is. This science, at least in the opinion of its professors, quite compensates for, quote, the loss of the inspired autographs. So the loss of the inspired autographs is compensated for by the science of textual criticism. This is what they're saying in the Dublin Review article from 1881. And by its aid, the textual critic has no difficulty in telling amidst thousands of various readings what the sacred writer really wrote. This would be an unmixed blessing to the religious world if the text, if textual critics could but agree with, uh, agree with one another that each critic should have his own theory of revision or his own view of the age and genealogy of different manuscripts is not to be wondered at, 
but that two critics can agree upon a plain matter of fact is certainly surprising. So what they're saying there is absolutely true. Whether it's whether it's Griesbach or whether it's Tischendorf or whether it's Hort and Westcott, they all had different opinions about the 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 textual data that they were sifting through when they're doing textual criticism. They go on to say, what then has textual criticism done for the New Testament? It has destroyed the old Texas Receptus, which we see was their intention from Hort and Westcott. That was their intention. We see that, we saw that last week, excuse me, in the second video in this series. But it has failed to construct another in its place. Since the days of Griesbach, every critic and any uh, of any textual pretensions makes a text for himself. Lachman, Schultz, Tregellis, Tichendorf have published their texts. Dr. Westcott and Dr. Hort have just published another, the result of 20 years toil. Here then lay the chief difficulty in revising the New Testament. King James revisers had an easy task simply to translate uh, uh, simply to translate their text that Pope Stevens and po uh, as Pope as Bentley calls him had fixed for them, but the revisers of 1881 had first to find the text. So they're they're not text they're not translating the traditional text. They're not simply revising the King James Bible based upon the traditional Protestant text. They're first replacing it with an entirely new text. That's what he's saying here. They first had to find the text and then make the translation. Like Nebuchadnezzar's wise men, they were required first to find the dream and then make the interpretation. If, if they have failed and blame must rest upon them, for they could hardly be expected to be Daniels, but upon the church which put them to such a task. To anyone who knows what textual criticism is, how dubious its methods, how revolutionary its results, it is amazing that any church calling itself Christian should should hand over the sacred scriptures, the very title deeds of its existence, to change uh, to the change voting of critics who are scholars first and Christians afterwards, and some not Christians at all. That it should give these men power over the word of God to to find and loose to revise and excise to put it to put in and leave out, to form the text as well as give the interpretation. Yet this has been done by that church, which made it an article of its creed that other churches had erred and that nothing was to be believed but was found in Scripture and could be proved thereby. Folks, this is exactly what I've been telling you about in the previous two videos. Here we have it now at brass tacks. The observers of the revised version are saying the entire protestant principle has been undermined by what occurred in the revision committee now they go on in that article again I'm talking about this article from the dublin review they go on to say a lot, quite a bit in fact a revision which leaves out some 40 entire verses and makes 20,000 changes uh, cannot be charged with timidity but com but co um, comparative finality is another matter. It is an illusion to suppose that finality can be attained by petty compromises with rationalism. There they're saying it. This is a compromise with enlightenment rationalism. I said that in the last video. Now textual criticism is a tool belonging to rationalism. The revisers have borrowed it to help them revise their Bible. They have used the tool, they have used the tool sparingly but they have taught others to use it. Who will who will we less should say who will be less gentle? With a vorium of Bible having notes and various uh, editors or commentators, including variant readings from manuscripts or earlier editions, a good eyesight and an ignorant man can revise his Bible for himself, and soon there will be no Bible to revise. In the first days of Protestantism, private judgment fixed what scripture meant. Now textual criticism settles what script what scriptures say, and shortly higher criticism will reject text and meaning alike. What has happened in Germany will happen in England. Amen. But perhaps the most surprising change 
of all is John 539. It is no longer a search the scriptures, but ye search. Thus, Protestantism has last has lost the very cause of its being. It has been robbed of its only proof of Bible inspiration by by the correct rendering of 2 Timothy 3.16. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable. This is the corrupt reading of the RV. The old tradition, the old uh, transitional King James appears in the margin, should say traditional, uh, in the margin, a minority of the translators approve, uh, apparently adhering to it. So what the Dublin Review is doing, guys, it's basically taking everything we've said and it's showing you the fruit, the outcome of the stream that started back with Richard Simon in the this, in this mid-1600s. Now in the 19th century, in the 1800s, here's what is being said. We go on from the article in the Dublin Review. Lastly, we come to the most serious of all, visit the passages the revisers have thought proper to leave out altogether. So far, it has been a question of translation and of names, but here the vital uh, integrity of sacred scripture is affected by the sole authority of textual criticism. These men have dared to vote away some 40 verses from the inspired word. The eunuch's baptismal profession of faith is gone. The angel of the, pool, uh, of the pool of Bethesda has vanished. The angel of agony remains uh, till the next revision. The heavenly witnesses, John 5, uh, 1 John 5, 7, uh, have departed, and no marginal note mourns their loss. The last 12 verses of St. Mark are detached from the rest of the gospel and is ready for removal as soon as Dean Bergen dies, which I find a fascinating comment. The account of the woman taken in adultery is placed in brackets awaiting ex excision. Many other passages have a mark set against them in the margin to show, like forest trees, they are shortly destined for the critic's axe. Who can tell, who can tell when the destruction will cease? What have the offended readings done that textual critics should tear them from their home of centuries in the shire of God's temple. The sole offense of many is the careless copyist of many old uncial manuscripts skipped over them. The angel of Bethesda ha uh, may have been cured, etc. Now watch. But modern science has no need of his services, for it has proved without identifying the site that the spring has intermittent and the water uh, Kyabated. But our uh, but our intelligent critics forget to get rid of the paralytic woman who the Lord cured, as long as he remains in the text, his words will convict uh will convict them of folly. Folks, you can see very plainly what is going on. These guys are excoriating the revised version for its textual choices, and they're saying this is not going to help the body of Christ. This is not going to help the, the cause of Protestantism. This is going to significantly harm and hamper the cause of Protestantism. They say, we have spoken of the admissions and peculiarities and the omissions of the newly revised version. It only remains to express our deep anxiety as to its effect upon the religious mind of England and Scotland. It cannot but give a severe shock to those who have been brought up in the strictest sense of Protestantism. This is exactly what I was saying. Their fundamental doctrine of verbal inspiration is undermined. The land of Knox will mourn its dying Calvinism. The prophets of Bible religion will find no sure word for the Lord, uh, for the Lord is in the new gospel. But assuredly, the broad church will widen their tents yet more and rejoice in the liberty wherewith textual criticism has made them free. Already, one of their greatest oracles himself, a reviser, has declared that inspiration, quote, is not a part of the Bible in the whole, not in a singular passage, but in the general tendency and drift of the complete words. And he teaches a new way to convert the working classes from their belief, uh, quote, the real way, he says, to reclaim them is for the church, frankly, to admit that the documents on which they base their claims to, uh, to uh, um, attention are not to be accepted in blind obedience, 
but are to be tested and sifted and tried by all the methods that patience and learning can bring to bear. Then heaven help the poor working man if his soul hope of salvation lies in the new gospel of textual criticism. But what will those think who outside the Catholic Church will retain the old Catholic ideas about church and scripture? How bitter to them must be the sight of their Anglican bishops sitting with Methodists, Baptists, and Unitarians to improve the English Bible according to the modern ideas of progressive biblical criticism. Who gave these men the authority over the written word of God? It was not Parliament or Privy Council or the Church of England acting through convocation. To whom do they look for the necessary sanction and approval of their work, but to public opinion? One thing at least is certain. Now here it is. The Catholic Church will gain by the new revision, both directly and indirectly, directly because old errors are removed from the translation, indirectly, and here it is, because the Bible-only principle is proved to be false. It is not now at length too evident that the Scripture is powerless without the Church as the witness to its inspiration. This is exactly what Richard Simon said in the 1600s when he attacked the Protestant view of Sola Scriptura and the Protestant view of the Bible. Let me read it again. Because the Bible only principle is proved false, okay? So it's going to directly undermine Protestantism. It is not now at length too evident that the Scripture is powerless without the Church and the uh, as the witness to its inspiration to safeguard its integrity and the exponent of its meaning. It will now be clear to men which is the true Church, the real mother to whom the Bible of right belongs. Nor will it need Solomon's wisdom to see that the so-called church, which heartlessly gives up the hapless child to be cut in pieces by textual critics, cannot be the true mother. Whoa. This is, they are not pulling punches. They are not mincing words here in what the Dublin Review had to say. This is a stinging rebuke of the philosophical um, presuppositions of the men that gave the modern critical text in the Revised Version, as well as forecasting what the implications of it would be upon believing Christians in the, 20, in the 20th century, okay? So I'm not making this up. If you're upset with me, you need to be upset with the writers of the Dublin Review. So the idea that it's only, you know, a bunch of backwoods country, you know, bumpkins in the 20th and 21st century that would cling to the traditional text in the King James Bible that's not true. There were people at the time of its release that looked at it and realized this is a complete undermining of the Protestant view of Scripture. This is not Brian Ross saying this. This is uh, 19th century authors assessing it in this way. So let's look at just uh, two more shorter examples here just before I close off the video. Let's look at another publication. We're going to look at the 1892 publication, The Bible, what it is and is not by Joseph Wood. So that's this book right here, The Bible, What It Is and Is Not, a series of Sunday evening lectures delivered in Old, Mer Old Meeting Church, Birmingham. And again, this is dating from 1892. And I think we can find the page here. Let's go to page 59 in the PDF. And we can find the section right here. The Revised Version is of great doctrinal significance. It tends to break down the rigidity of orthodoxy, and it justifies that liberal Christianity which we in this place hold and teach. So here is a liberal, I believe Unitarian Christian, if my memory's not wrong here on wood, praising the Revised Version, praising it for its great doctrinal significance, praising it because it's breaking down the rigidity of orthodoxy, and it justifies the liberal Christianity which we in this place hold and teach. We, at any rate, have every reason to be grateful for the help which the Revised Version gives us to a better understanding of the work of Christ and the Apostles, who we know the fatal force and fascination of words have learnt to realize the immense 
and inconceivable mistakes which have been made by nearly all English churches through the watch, the deficiencies and mistakes of the authorized version, welcome the welcome with deepest thankfulness the Bible which the revisers have placed in our hands as, as bringing before the English reader for the first time the true sense of the inspired writers. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. Okay? Here you have a liberal Christian praising the revised version for how much easier it's going to make them, or how much easier it's going to make it for them to defend their liberal Christianity, their theological liberalism, and how it's removing the deficiencies and the mistakes of the authorized version. And they're thanking with great, with, with deepest thankfulness, the Bible which the revisers have placed in our hands as bringing before the English reader for the, for the first time, the true sense of the inspired writer. So that means for the first time, for the first time in the late 19th century, the true meaning of scripture is now in the hands of the English readers. So all that time for nearly 300 years at this point that they were reading from, um, the Geneva Bible, the King James Bible, all those Bibles for 300 years, the King James, they didn't really know the true sense of the inspired writers. And now they, they're thanking for the revision and for the mindset that brought it about. Again, you cannot make it up. Let's also then, in conclusion, we'll look at one other short one here, which I believe is this one right here, from Joseph uh, Husner's 1895 publication, The Chapters of the Bible. And we are talking about this book then, Chapters of Bible Study, or the Popular Introduction of the Study of the Sacred Scripture by the Reverend Herman uh, Hooser, Hessner, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but again, 1895. And we want to go to page 138 of the PDF, and we can check this out. And we are looking for where it says besides, I believe. Where did it go? You know what? I am just going to read it from my notes for the sake of time. Besides these changes, which must be a shock to many an English Protestant who has accustomed himself by long reading of the Bible to believe in verbal inspiration, there are a number of omissions in the new revised text, which, it, which in all amount to about 40 entire verses. It appears then that the King James Bible of some years ago has not been, as most Protestants of necessity claim for it, the pure, authentic, unadulterated Word of God. Again, there were scores of English Christians for nearly 300 years, nearly, not that whole time, but nearly 300 years, that accepted their King James Bible as the Word of God. Okay, And if not, what guarantee have we to the promiscuous body of recent translators, however learned, now watch, with all not inspired, have given us the pure, authentic, unadulterated word of God. So far, Protestant revisions have done Catholics a service in removing by successive corrections one error after another from the Reformed Bible, thus demonstrating the correctness of the old Vulgate, but they have also led Protestants to reflect seriously and to realize that the Bible-only principle, sola scriptura, is proven to be false and dangerous. They must see that the scripture is powerless without the church as the witness to its inspiration, the safeguard of its integrity, and the exponent of its meaning. There you have it, folks. And the reason I couldn't find that is because it's actually from two pages, 122 and 120, uh, sorry, 131 of Husner's book right here. Okay. So what have we seen? We've seen three examples of, sorry, we've seen four examples of responses to revised version. I have more. I've got a bunch more that I could show you, but I think this video has already been long enough. And I think I've showed you a sufficient number of examples to get the point. How were they responding? How are English Protestants responding? 
Well, if you were on the liberal side, if you were a pro-Catholic side, you were extolling, you were praising, you were you were singing the praises literally of the revised version because it was undermining the uh, the principle of sola scriptura. It was undermining the Protestant Bible only principle. It was reinforcing the Catholic understanding that you needed the church to tell you what the scripture was. Same as what we saw from Richard Simon in my first video, uh, in the first video in this series, which was this one right here, assessing the origins of originals only. If you were a liberal Christian, theologically, you were singing the praises and extolling the revised version because it was helping you make your arguments. If you were a conservative Christian who believed in inspiration and the infallibility of scripture, you were bemoaning the release of the revised version for all of its changes and for the influence that rationalism and uh, German higher criticism were having. And you were saying, look, this is going to open the floodgates and this is going to result in nothing good. So here we can see in this video the responses through four examples to the release of the revised version. Now, before you go, I want to remind you about a couple things. First of all, if you haven't already done so, if you would consider picking up my book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact as a way of supporting the ministry, we would certainly appreciate, appreciate that. We want to remind you here about YouTube. If you haven't done so, please subscribe and ring the alarm bell. Please like this video, leave a comment, share it, help us get the word out. I want to remind you about the Grace History Project rebroadcasting. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on this channel at 9 o'clock in the morning, we are rebroadcasting the Grace History Project. Monday, I just re-released -re and rebroadcasted Lesson 42 on Confronting Dispensational Straw Men. And so by the end of the week, there's going to be 44 lessons in this playlist. If you're interested in uh, church history from a dispensational point of view, please consider checking out and sharing with your friends the Grace History Project playlist. I'm also excited about what we're doing in our adult Sunday school class at church at 9 a.m. Uh, as we are now getting really deep into a consideration of the work in progress primary documents on the King James Bible. Last Sunday, I just taught Lesson 166 where we started looking at Manuscript 98 at Lambeth Palace Library. Please check out the class from this generation forever. Please join us live Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern time and be a part of that class as I'm going through it. This coming Sunday, I'm going to be talking about the impact of Manuscript 98 on the readings found in the King James Bible. And we're going to be looking at two sample passages, Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 13. I'm excited about that. Also want to remind you about my podcast with my wife, the Just Grace It podcast with Brian and Becky Ross. We do have a new episode released last week, What Kind of Heart Do Believers Have? New, Clean, and Obedient, or Deceitful and Desperately Wicked. You want to check that out if you haven't already done so. And hey, want to remind you about our reading challenge here in 2022, where uh, we at Grace Life Bible Church are reading Paul's epistles every month through a reading program. There are two videos. I'll put this link in the description. There are two videos explaining it, and then there are a variety of different options as far as reading plans that you might want to use in a given month, as well as links to where you can order a King James Reader's Bible if you're interested to do that. And then last, our live stream. We live stream from Grace Life Bible Church every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for adult Sunday school, and then at around 1040 for our main service. You can catch our live stream either on YouTube, on Facebook, or right here now on the church's webpage. You can watch it right here when we go live by clicking on our live stream link from the homepage. A lot of things going on, a lot of opportunities for learning and for edification. Uh, we have a real heart and a passion to try to build up the church, the body of Christ, to try to edify through a variety of different uh, studies and, and so on and so forth. But look, folks, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never relied and trusted exclusively on his shed blood on the cross as the only total and complete payment for your sin, please do it today before it's everlasting too late. If you would just place simple faith in the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his shed blood upon the cross for your sin, his burial and his resurrection from the dead, he wants to give you eternal life as a free gift. You'll pass from death to life. You'll be taken out from under the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. 
You'll be complete in Christ. You'll be given all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your time, and we will see you next week.